and we are live. Thank you very much. Welcome everybody to the uh, Social Services Committee jointly of the County of Brant and the City of Bradford. Uh, I'm uh, Mayor Kevin Davis. I'm the Vice Chair. Unfortunately, the Chair, because of uh, personal matters, is not able to attend this morning, so I'll be chairing in his absence. And we have from the City Clerk's Office, Lisa Madden. I think she's providing the clerking services. Lisa, have you taken the roll call? Through the Chair, the roll has been taken. All right, I'll exercise the chair's prerogative just to make a small announcement of probably of, of significance for the county members. Maybe notice, you may wonder why is the mayor wearing a hoodie to this meeting? Well, I'm wearing it because this week it's, this is Grand Bridge Energy, uh, which is the merged corporation of power providers for the North Dumfries uh, city of Cambridge and also the city of Brantford and does provide power this new merge corporation Grand Bridge to much of the county. And I want to let you know that we have three members who local people who will be on the board uh, for point of reference if you have any issues with the power service that uh, Grand Bridge provides power to in the county that'd be myself, Craig Mann, who is the owner of Mann Distilleries, he's actually the chair of the board and Scott Saint, who's also a Brantford resident as well. So with that, I'd like to remind members of council, staff and our viewing public of the electronic participation policy for hybrid meetings. For those staff and delegates joining electronically, please keep your video and microphones off until requested by the moderator members of council. All rules for delegations under the city's procedural bylaw continue to apply. In the event a connection service interruption occurs, we'll that affects quorum. Uh, we adjourn for up to 15 minutes to regain quorum. If quorum can't be achieved, the meeting will be adjourned. So members, does anybody have a declaration or conflict of interest they have to make uh, regarding any of the items that are on our agenda this morning? And if so, please physically raise your hand. I don't, Mr. Mayor, but I'm just glad to see that was a cat on uh, Councillor Howe's uh, shoulder. I thought he had a snake coming up his back, but it was uh, a cat's tail. So uh, I'm pleased to see he's safe. Yeah. Well, I'm glad Councillor Schles for keeping an eye on all of us. Um, so uh, with that, we'll move into, uh, I should end, well, Councillor Ferrier is not here, but uh, he would have declared a conflict in item 5.2 because uh, he is employed by Mohawk. But anyway, we'll move to item three then, which is, does anybody want any of the items uh, separated for uh, separate consideration and consent? Yes, Councillor Howes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, if the separate item 6.3 for some discussion later. Thank you. 6.3. Councillor Howes. Anyone else? Councillor Miller. Uh, yes, uh, 5.1, please. 5.1. Anyone else? All right. Okay, so we have two separate items then, 6.3 which is the um, <clears throat> Community and Affordable Housing Overview and 5.1, which is the Canada Wide Early Learning and Child Care Update. And so, can I get a mover and seconder then to place the items that have not been separated? Thank you, Mayor Bailey's moving, seconded by Councillor Sless. Uh, all those in favor, please physically raise your hand. Councillor Howes, you, you with us? Opposed? Carry. <clears throat> and we have one uh, presentation for today. And uh, our Director of Housing and Homelessness. Trisha, where are you? I'm here. Oh, Good there night. you are. Well, you're in person. So uh, if you could please state your name for us and um, you can then move into your presentation. You have 10 minutes inclusive questions from committee members. Thank you and good morning. My name is Tricia Gibbons, Director of Housing and Homelessness Services. And this presentation is intended to illustrate some of the key points outlined in the staff report entitled Community and Affordable Housing Overview. Slide, please. The term affordable housing is used broadly to apply to many situations. In fact, federally, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation identifies it as housing that costs less than 30% of a household's before tax income. This broad term uh, definition applies to both rental and home ownership housing. 
In Ontario, however, the term affordable is formally defined in the provincial policy statement. And in the context of rental housing, the word affordable specifically means the least of one of these two options. Sorry, next slide, please. So of the two options, the first is a unit where the rent is not more than 30% of the gross annual household income for low or, and moderate income households, or a unit where the rent is at or below the average market rent of a unit in the regional market area. So these two definitions are very important as they are both applied in the context of housing that is affordable, but they're applied in two different ways. One where rental costs may be subsidized, such as rent geared to income, and one where the construction costs might be supported through government grants and the rents are charged at or below the average market rent for the region, but they're not necessarily subsidized. The focus of this presentation is on affordable rental housing that includes both of these types of affordable. Slide, please. This slide illustrates affordable housing over time. And it's key to note that the terminology has changed as well from labels, including public housing to social housing, to community housing, and now affordable housing. The term community housing is still used to re refer to housing developed under these legacy programs and are managed by local housing corporations, nonprofit housing providers and cooperatives. We see that over the decades, there's been a shift from federal to provincial and then municipal responsibilities of these housing developments. And from 2000 onwards, new housing developments were funded differently, which has created new models of affordable housing and rent and different rents. The report highlights this in detail, um, the impact of devolution and the changes to responsibilities uh, specific to service managers. Slide, please. So here we see the key areas uh, where devolution has impacted affordable housing. It changed the responsibility of administering and funding affordable housing to service managers. It changed the funding models from rent geared to income to below market rents, and it changed the legal relationships for community housing. Community housing units continue to exist through nonprofit housing providers, co-ops, as well as local housing providers. The new funding models also create opportunities for development of affordable housing units that charged rent based on average market rent calculations and opened up development of affordable housing with the private market. Slide, please. Through cur the current legislation, the Housing Services Act, which replaced the 2000 Social Housing Reform Act, Brantford is the delegated consolidated municipal service manager for the city and the county, as we know, and the expectations and responsibilities are outlined in the specific legislation, which includes how community housing is administered, but also homelessness services. Um, the requirements for how community housing is subsidized are prescribed in this legislation uh, and the accompanying regulations um, and applies to the entire province. Slide, please. So now that we've set some parameters around these definitions um, and some of the history, we'll look at the broader context of housing. This slide is a little bit dated, but it gives an illustration of the housing continuum and although the entry into housing is not always linear, this picture gives an idea of the range of experiences along the housing continuum from homelessness to home ownership. And within uh, the city, as the service manager for the county and the city, we offer services and supports along this entire continuum. Slide, please. This graphic is borrowed from colleagues at the region of uh, Halton, but I, I like it because it shows the funding pieces along the continuum, where we have uh, rent geared to income units that are government funded, um, as outlined through the Housing Services Act, and then affordable rental units that might be built with capital funding um, and are under capital funding agreement and then the, the rent being charged uh, below the average market rent or lower depending on the particular agreement. Slide please. 
So this slide demonstrates the different ways that housing can be organized. Municipalities are also housing providers, not just service managers. And there are other partners involved in providing affordable housing, nonprofits, cooperatives, and the private sector providers. Um, and some can just be community housing, and some are just affordable housing, and some are a mixture of both. Slide, please. So hopefully you can see some of the data on this slide. This is a summary of the number of units uh, we have to date and each housing type, and also flagging here our service level standards. So the 1,645 number is prescribed in the legislation, and that's our minimum service level standard. And you'll see from the slide here, we currently um, are above the service level standard. Slide, please. And this is just a different illustration of the data from the previous slide, showing how through devolution, the units uh, came down um, and applied to local housing, municipal and nonprofit and cooperatives, and then the other housing types as well. Slide, please. Affordable housing providers that received capital funding also have end dates based on their initial funding agreements. Private sector providers could potentially stop providing affordable housing units when these agreements end. This visual identifies uh, the, the affordable housing developments that, were, that have been constructed over the past 10 to 20 years and where these agreements will be expiring. So you'll see in and around 2044, all of the agreements will be expired. Slide, please. Between 2006 and 2011, 440 new units were constructed under the Canada Ontario Affordable Housing Program. And then between 2014 and 2020, 228 additional units were constructed uh, with a number of those units specifically to address the homeless population. Slide please. So the good news is that we have two councils who are committed to the ongoing development of sustainable, affordable housing. And this is important because there is a commitment to own and operate these units, therefore ensuring that they remain affordable in perpetuity. Through the mayor's task force, both municipalities have committed to focus on and prioritize the development of new affordable housing. And this positive news is that there is a commitment and active planning for the creation of new affordable housing that will remain affordable into the future. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. So we've got about uh, two minutes left. Uh, Councillor Sluss. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Mr. Mayor, and thanks for the presentation, Trish. The, um, I want to understand the definition a little better. Uh, I think provincially you said it's either 30% uh, of the gross uh, income of, of a family, that would be considered um, affordable, or if it's a rental below the average in the region, it, that, that's what the provincial, it has to be either or, is that what you said? Thank you, through the chair, either or and whatever is lower. Okay, so if I understand that correctly, if, if the average, market rent is $2,000 a month for an apartment. And somebody comes in and rents one for 1,950. That's considered affordable housing. Thank you, through the chair. What I uh, forgot to mention in the presentation is that the average market rent is calculated and that's also prescribed. So each year we're provided with that data from the province of what the average market rent is calculated at. And that's data that's drawn from census. Um, so it's not necessarily reflective of what perhaps a rent is being charged in the community. The AMR, average market rent, is a prescribed amount that we are given. Okay, well, then, then let me rephrase that. So then if the prescribed amount given is $2,000 uh, average in the community and somebody uh, is renting out a, a unit for $1,950, can they call that affordable housing by definition? It's between the two. So you're evaluating whatever is the lesser of 30% of that individual's income or mm -hmm. the unit is at or below. But I do agree, it's, it's not clear. <laughs> but that right. is the definition. 
Okay, appreciate that. Thanks, Rich. Yeah, so we've gone beyond uh, 10 minutes, but uh, Councillor Toski, it has been separated, <clears throat> this particular matter by Councillor Howell. So you can, under our rules, you can put questions to staff at that time. So uh, thank you very much, Trish, for that. And I'm sure, please stick around, because I'm sure there will be some further questions that will come your way later regarding that presentation. And so now we'll move, uh, Nina, a mover and a seconder to put the two items on the floor that have been separated. Um, so moved by Councillor Sluss, seconded by Councillor Bell. All right, we'll move to the first item that's been separated. Councillor Miller, uh, 5.1, Canada-wide early learning and child care update. You asked that to be separated. I did. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just, yeah, a couple of questions to staff. I'll go through them one at a time. Uh, first one is that, yeah, there's 86,000 new licensed child care spaces across Canada to be created through this. Um, it, they're going mostly, well, to high needs area. How is Brantford, Brant County um, compared to other areas? Um, are, would you consider this a high needs area? Or any, my question, what I'm trying to get is, do you think we'll get any of those 86,000 uh, new child care spaces? I'm asking you to kind of speculate a bit, but thoughts on that? Sure, uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Aaron Wallace, Director of Community Programs. Uh, so I can answer the second part first, and I'll ask, uh, with your permission, Mayor Davis and uh, Michelle Connor to chime in on the, the high needs definition, but we will certainly get some of those spaces. You're seeing some of those announcements come through, and we know more announcements are on the way. So city and county are doing pretty well in terms of getting some announcements for, for capital builds for child cares, particularly related to school board builds. Uh, but with your permission, Mayor Davis, I'll ask Michelle Connor to, uh, to chime in on the, the high needs question. Go ahead. Good morning. Um, through the chair, I am Michelle Connor. I'm the manager of children's services and early years uh, for the city of Brantford. And um, the province has advised that starting in 2023, they're going to take a look at a managed growth plan focusing on high needs. And so while they haven't clearly defined what that is, they have spoken about uh, areas of um, families living uh, in lower income, uh, different uh, cultures, Indigenous, uh, so they, they haven't clearly defined what that's going to look like. They tell us that a consultation is coming and more debt, more information is coming in 2023. However, as Aaron spoke to, since uh, 2019, we've had a significant number of uh, spaces increase in our community. And um, we've had uh, 64 space childcare built at Central Public School, 49 spaces built at Our Lady of Providence, we have uh, 64 spaces lined up for the new Grand Erie District uh, School in West Brant, 64 space addition to Banbury School, a 64 space childcare being built onto Cobblestone Public School in Paris, 24 space addition to St. Marie Bourgeois. And uh, as uh, Mayor Davis knew, because he was at the announcement last week with myself, there's 128 spaces earmarked for the new high school that's going to be in kind of the northeast Brantford area. So that's a, uh, 457 new spaces. That doesn't include applications from private child cares who are looking to be licensed. And there are always uh, some of those in the queue. Um, so we're quite hopeful that uh, we'll have an increased number. And how do we compare to um, the province? I, we did uh, some data that you saw in the 10-year child care and early years plan that says we have one licensed child care space for every five children uh, in our community. And that is somewhat comparable to similar size and economic, economic status um, municipalities. Some uh, municipalities have spaces for one in four. Um, so our intention at this point is to hope that we will continue with at least one in five, but we suspect that there will be uh, growth. The other area where there will be growth of childcare is the um, licensed home childcare. Uh, private home childcare providers uh, will be interested in participating in the Canada-wide and early learning childcare programs so that families can benefit from the reduced costs. So there will be, uh, we suspect there will be some increase in licensed home childcare spaces as well moving forward. Okay, I appreciate that and I'll keep going until the mayor cuts me off. Um, well, I am, gonna, I am gonna cut you off because oh, okay. you're down to four minutes, but 
I'll put you down for a second uh, speaking round. We'll see if anybody else has any wants to ask any questions. Not seeing any raised hands. You've got another four minutes, Councillor Miller. Thank you. Uh, so, so my, my last and second question. It's it's okay. So we're going to move to ten dollars a day. And again, I'm going to ask you to speculate. We're getting five point three million to help us get there. But when you obviously when you lower the cost of something, you increase demand. And I'm just um, any thoughts on this increased demand? Do you see that? Do you see a huge surge coming if we when when the cost is lowered to ten dollars a day? And then the second part of that is, if that five point three million isn't enough to get us to ten dollars a day, who's picking up the who's put who's who's picking up that extra cost? So that would that be a province federal thing, or, or would they be looking at the municipalities to cover that? So you might know, yeah, I'm asking you to speculate a little bit, but any thoughts on, on, the, on those questions? Yeah, with your permission again, Mayor Davis, I'll ask Michelle to, to provide, provide the answer. Uh, thank you. Uh, through the chair, we do suspect that there will be some increased demand. On the day of the announcement, we saw an, an increase in applications on our one list system for licensed child care, but that's leveled out. So I think it's it we're really going to have to see what that looks like um, moving forward. Um, and the 5.3 million was based on provincial modeling to support the 25% decrease that's going to happen in 2022. It's our understanding when the 50% decrease happens in 2023, there will be provincial funds to cover that. My understanding is that money will come incrementally as the, as the uh, child care rates go down and the wages go up. Oh, okay, I appreciate that. Yeah, I guess, uh, and you said that in the report, we'll, we'll have to see. I know you left some of the, the numbers blank as we go forward, but it, it'll be interesting to see. So thank you very much. You're welcome. So not seeing any other raised hands for questions or discussion, I'll call the vote for uh, 5.1 then. All those in favor, please raise your hands physically. Uh, opposed? So the matter passes. All right, uh, we'll move then to item 6.3, which was the other item separated. 6.3 on the consent items, and that's the community and affordable housing overview. And I'll go right to you, Councillor Ntoski, because I know you had your hand raised and we didn't get to you during the presentation. So I assume it's about the same subject. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, it is. And, and my questioning is along the same lines as, as Councillor Sless's, because I can't, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around how this works. So if a developer comes to town and says, I'm going to build this building and whatever, 10% of it's going to be affordable housing, well, they only have the formula of what the province is saying is affordable housing. So now someone who wants to apply for a rental unit, but makes that, that whatever cost they're going by this formula is less than the 30% of their gross, then are they just getting turned away? Because like, how does, how does this work? How do you come up with an either or number when you don't know what, who's going to inhabit a rental or what their gross income is? How do we know if that's less? And do they just get turned away when probably they're going to get more charging a little bit less on on uh, the anything less than market, right? Anything less than market is probably going to be quite a bit higher than thirty percent of gross incomes for people. So, so I'm I'm trying to figure out how this works. How does this get Im implemented? <laughs> Thank you. Through the chair, um, in terms of the definition. They're used specifically the average market rent would be used when we're looking at the development of new uh, rental housing. And that is where we take the definition from CMHC and identify what the average market rent is. The detailed list, I believe, is outlined in the staff report of what the current uh, we just after the report received the 2022 um, average market rent calculations. So those are the amounts we use when we're entering into agreements with developers who are building affordable housing. And those agreements identify what the average market rent is and what 80% of that would be for to, in order to calculate the rent. So to state it all again, when we're entering into an agreement with a developer who is building affordable housing, so they may be receiving grants or some other incentive to develop that housing, 
we look at what the year is. We look to our reference guide on what we've our prescribed average market rent is. And then we calculate what 80% of that would be. And that would be the affordable rent for those developments. And then in the agreement, it's we outline what the rent is for that year and how it would be calculated going forward. For a developer who is simply building, building rent, the purpose-built rental, but not capital A, as I call it, affordable, they can refer to those averages to see what we consider average market rent. But unless they're entering into an agreement uh, with the municipality to formally build uh, affordable housing, that's the distinction. So affordable in terms of the work that we do here is prescribed and it's linked to a specific development and there's an agreement attached to it to lock it in as affordable. Okay, the so other sorry, Trish, I just, I don't want to, sorry for letting me interrupt because I'm going to run out of time, but I, I still, I, I, and I get you're kind of in a box, you've got to follow a formula, but this to me still is not an either or. Because if a if, you, if we enter into an uh, agreement with a developer, it is going to be less than market, whether it's ten dollars or whatever that prescribed number is. So let's say we've got that development and it's five years in, and somebody applies. Is it either or, or are they just going to turn them away because they can get a little bit less than market rather than thirty percent? In this formula, it's I don't see it ever being the thirty percent of someone's gross income. Uh, thank you. Through the chair, the thirty percent is is typically the deeper deeper subsidized housing. So rent geared to income is specifically thirty percent of the income, unless uh, the individual or household is is on uh, OW or ODSP, where there's a there's a different calculation for that. Um, but RGI rent geared to income is where you'd see the thirty percent calculation. Um, so in our community housing uh, nonprofit locations, that's where that calculation is used. And then for capital builds where they've built outside of that model, that's where we use the affordable housing calculation. Okay, so in practice, it really doesn't become an either or. Uh, I'll have to cut you off there, Councillor Antoski. Can I finish that sentence? No, you've actually gone quite a bit beyond four minutes. So, right. <clears throat> so sorry, you can put you can go around a second time. Like, no. Okay. Uh, let's see. Next, I'm going to go to Councillor House. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to staff, uh, my questions are specific to the uh, uh, to the Trillium build that's coming up, and to the report that the report mentions the Trillium build, uh, page eleven of the report or page ninety-five of our documents. Um, it towards the bottom of the page, I see in the middle of the paragraph, all new housing units being constructed will be affordable housing, with different levels of below market rental rates. And I'm wondering, using Trillium, the new Trillium build as an example, can you sketch out for me? uh kind of how the how that mix works out because we we will have and we have we have had constituents who are asking about uh um what the composition will be of that building and uh, i know that uh those of us who get those questions need to be able to respond and and explain the strategy thank you um thank you through the chair um this is still in draft right now. Staff are actively working on all of the units will be affordable at minimum. Right now, we're looking at um, three different pockets where uh, of the 49 to 50 units, 30% would be at 80%. So the calculation would be the average market rent and then 80% of what that is would be the rent um, in a combination of one and two bedroom units. Another 30% would be uh, the average market rent, 100% of the average market rent, which is still considered low end market. And then 40% would be average market rent with rental supplements attached. So giving a deeper level of affordability. Um, so the rental supplements comes out of, of a different funding stream, but so we're trying to capture different levels of affordability to ensure that different uh, household incomes can access these units. Uh, thank you for the response. If I could follow up, Mr. Chair, within my four minutes, the, uh, the, 
that second basket that you described, um, it, can you help me help help me explain that to residents? And, and I know that you know you put together a great report, which which helps us try to understand definitions. But when we say to a resident that that a th almost a third of the fifty units will be a hundred percent of average market value. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how we can still call them affordable. Um, and if you just, just help, help me figure out how I'm going to explain that to others. Um, thanks. Thank you through the chair. So right now the data and recognizing that the updated data just come, came out and in preparing for today, I was using the old data. So to give an illustration, the average market rent for one bedroom uh, based on the older data, so this will be adjusted slightly, would be $1,200. And the average market rent um, for these units is estimated to be $1,350. Now that will be adjusted somewhat. Um, the chart in the report, I believe was updated. The information I, I grabbed this morning is a little bit out of date, but so the average market rent for a one bedroom approximately 1,200 for a two bedroom, approximately 1,350. Okay, it's, it's the, and I understand that, it's, it's the categorizing, the using the words affordable when, when we're at the average market rate. That's the part I'm struggling with. And I, I realize I'll be running out of time and perhaps I can pursue this offline with staff a little more. Thank okay, thank you, Councillor. Uh, next, Councillor Schloss. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to Councillor Howe's uh, question, my understanding is that we put a mixture of market rent and subsidized rent, and I forget the third category where it's um, a certain percentage below uh, the market, and we mix that so that the building itself becomes self-sustainable. I, I think that's, I think that's the answer to his question. I, I think. Uh, he hearing what I'm hearing, we, we try and make them so that you're not reaching into your pocket every year to maintain the operation of the building, because you've got a mixture of market rent and below market rent and subsidized rent all in one building, so you don't ghettoize an area, but at the same time, you have a self-sustaining building, so you're not constantly feeding money into it to keep it uh, in a suitable condition and, and looked after. But my question is, I, what you described, Trish, was when the city builds something. But when a private sector firm comes in and is building affordable housing, um, I think it all changes, at least what I observe, it all changes. Um, you're talking about 20% below market. Uh, it, they don't have to go below 20% market, they just have to go below market. So I, I, I don't know how we control that or, or how, we, how we make sense of all that. Trish, it, it almost seems the definition, what it, the definition is whatever you want the definition to be. That, that, that kind of seems to be the definition because it, it's a very, uh, it's very fluid, very moving target. Uh, am, am I just getting totally confused? Uh, thank you through the chair. So for a private developer who was seeking to create some affordable housing development, if they were going through a funding program, so depending on what the funding program was, it would be identified uh, the percentage or the number of units that could be affordable. Um, and then it would be prescribed the, whether it's 80% of average market rate, um, market rent or beyond, that would be prescribed in the funding, whether it was a provincial funding or even municipal funding. And then that would be captured in the municipal housing um, the agreement that was put in place. So the, the agreements are very detailed and articulate specifically how and the amounts of rent and what they will be and how they can or cannot increase over time. So that's how we maintain them. The waterfall chart that I uh, provided in the presentation shows that over time, those agreements do end and uh, we're coming to a place where some of those affordable rental units um, will those agreements will end and there'll be no obligation of those private buildings to continue to offer affordable rents. So, so Trish, just to give you an example, if somebody, a private sector is building a, a high rise building and they can advertise, they, they have no 
agreements with anybody, but they can simply say, we're going to build affordable housing and, and they, they rent them out at 5% below market. They're not lying. How do we deal with that? Uh, thank you. And through the chair. So I distinguish them in my, my mind as sort of the capital A affordable and the lowercase a affordable. So the capital A would be the defined prescribed linked to legislation and formalized agreements with the municipality. And the lowercase a is affordable because it's below what would normally be charged, but it isn't linked to anything specific. It's just a, a developer or a building that's offering rent um, at a lower rate. We could also consider that to be attainable, attainable versus capital A affordable. Okay, that, that's another definition I'm not aware of. So then attainable is another category? Uh, through the chair, I'm sorry for throwing that out. Attainable is a new terminology that's just uh, coming out. I know that uh, at the county of Brant, through the, their official plan review, they were exploring those different definitions. Um, so attainable is a different term. It's not formally defined in any of the city's uh, documents at this time. It's just a new term that's out, out there right now um, to distinguish from capital A affordable versus attainable. So the lowercase a affordable, I suppose. Right. So we'll move now to uh, Councillor Bell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have a question which actually follows on from something that's just been mentioned. On table seven, it looks like we're going to, I'm going to use the term lose, uh, 519 affordable units as they come out of that period whereby they're obliged to provide uh, affordable rents. Uh, did that, was that taken into account in the Mayor's Task Force uh, analysis of the affordable housing market? I'm not sure who would answer that one best. Uh, thank you through the chair. I think this was part of the analysis through the mayor's task force and uh, the basis and a foundational piece for the commitment to build um, the 500 plus units that would continue to be municipally owned and maintained. Um, and then the other piece to that is the 337 units that would be built in partnership with nonprofit organizations. And through the 10 year plan, um, it is the plan to retain the affordable housing units into the future. So that was a change from the past where we would do these agreements, um, but there was an end date. So we're shifting the focus to ensure we're maintaining and keeping in perpetuity those new affordable units. Thank you, that, that's helpful. But so could you say a little bit more about what we will do to try and keep these 519 in the affordable housing category, because that, that's a huge number. It's equal to the number we want to rebuild. Thank you, and through the chair, this is a pretty big question, and we will be coming um, in a month or two with another report speaking specifically to end of operating agreements and legislative changes, and we're also going to speak to this issue, so we will be coming back with some additional information in the next month or two. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have one more question, if I may. I think I've got a couple of minutes. Oh, yes. Um, yes, you do. Go ahead. Um, so in respect of, of um, developers working with us to increase the um, number of uh, affordable housing uh, units, have we had any interest from any of the major developers? I know we have the folks like Habitat for Humanity working with us, but have we had any of the major developers that are operating both in the city and the county come forward and say, we would like to work with you uh, to increase the stock? Um, thank you through the chair. Um, I can say that the short answer is yes. Um, there's nothing that we're able to share publicly at this time. But there's two pieces. There are developers who reach out to us and then our department through our housing development team actively work with and seek out uh, partnerships. That's part of the ongoing new position. So the short answer is yes, but not able to share specific details at this time. So if I may, Mr. Mayor, could, we, could I request a, a report or a, an in-camera session where we hear a little bit more about this? Because I think it's, it's vital that we get this group of, of people on board because we as the, the municipal sector cannot solve this problem 
all on our own because it's heading that way that it will fall into our lap. So we need to make all the efforts we can to engage with the commercial sector of residential developers. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm going to ask. So, so Trish, the the rent geared income, which is where someone's paying, uh, they, they're either getting a subsidy or they're paying a rent that's based on that income, which is you know less than thirty percent. Primarily, we provide that uh, through uh, the developments that we own in our nonprofit housing corporations, and also the co-ops and other nonprofit housing um, developments. They're the ones that provide that kind of housing generally. Is that correct? Uh, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So if I'm a private developer and I want to build a building and I'm not going to take any government incentives, I can, under the Charter of Rights and exercising my rights to free speech, I mean, I can say, hey, I got a, I got affordable, attainable rents. And there's nothing we can do about that, correct? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, theoretically. I mean, that's yes. just part of their marketing. But, but many developers... Uh, they're going primarily as to CMHC, is it not, where they get interest-free mortgages. And in return for that, they have to agree to a certain percentage of the rents in their building being that 80 or 70% less than the CMHC, the average, whatever you called it, the rent. Is that correct? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, and then and then they have to enter an agreement with the city, but the and the city's, but the city's not giving them money or giving them interest-free mortgages. It's coming usually from the federal government through the CMHC. Is that correct? Mr. Chair, yes. Yep. Okay. So then what happens is they then get uh, an interest-free mortgage. And in return, they got they have to provide whatever it is, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 percent of the units in that building will then have to be that that rent, which is really determined by that formula you told us. And that only lasts for whatever it is, 20, 30 years, whatever it is that's in their agreement. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, and so those private developers that are building using that CMHC, no interest money, they're not providing rent geared to income units. It's just a certain percentage of the units in the building will have lower rents based on the CMHC formula. Yes. Okay. Hope that helps some members. Um, I've actually seen some of those agreements, and um, yeah, they're very specific about the rents that can be charged. So, Councillor, for a second go around, Councillor Intos. Oh, hold it. I think Councillor Vanishdale, you had your hand up. I'm a fickle creature. I changed my mind, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right, Councillor Councillor Intoski. Thank you, Mayor. I'll, I'll just finish with my last sentence, and it, it actually feeds in quite nicely to what, what you were just explaining. Um, I, think, I think where I struggle with it is the province gives an, you know, a formula with two definitions that are either or, but in practice, they really aren't. It's this for rent geared to income, and it's this for, for private developers. There's, there's really, there doesn't seem to be any either or in either of them. So, so anyways, it's, it's a struggle we'll all have to deal with and, and um, we'll keep it going. Thank you. Oh, and Tricia, my second speaking opportunity, I think I failed to mention that uh, actually the city does incentivize the private developers, do we not? Because it, let's say 10% of their units are gonna be that CMHC funded 80% uh, or 70%. They, they don't pay development charges on that part of their development, is that correct? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. That's correct. And just as a plug, we are bringing a report <laughs> for this committee next cycle on that specific issue, outlining the incentives provided. And in fact, we even have a deeper incentive if they're going to 70% of the average market rent. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I uh, just wanted to make that clear that that's how the municipality kind of pitches in and helps incentivize it, at least here in Brantford. So, uh, any other questions? Uh, so, I'll call the vote then on uh, consent item 6.3, uh, which is basically to receive the report and direct that uh, copy be forwarded to the staff of the County of Brant. So, all those in favor, please raise your hand. 
suppose. So <laughs> I got, want to make sure I got you in there, Council Miller. All right. Um, so there are no uh, resolutions. Uh, there are no notices of motion. And so I'm going to, the meeting of the Social Services Committee is now adjourned. And so we'll now proceed to the Brantford Municipal Nonprofit Housing Corporation Board of Directors meeting. And uh, the county councillors are excused. This is the, this is the nonprofit that um, city councillors are on the board of. Bye, everybody. I have, a, I have a question, Kevin. Well, the meeting's formally ended. Do you want to call me afterwards and talk about it? Well, I just want to make sure I get an agenda for the next meeting. Thank you. Yep, sure. Absolutely. And also the parking pass. Okay. So uh, with that, I'll call to order the um, Brantford Municipal Nonprofit Housing Corporation Board of Directors meeting. Lisa, I think you're, yes, you're clerking on this one as well? That's correct. All right, thank you for that. And I, I assume you've taken the attendance? Roll has been taken. Thank you. Uh, declaration of conflict of interest. Anybody have a conflict? See no raised hands. Uh, we've not, we have no presentations or delegations. And so we'll, um, if I can get a mover and second, replace all the items for consideration, consent on the floor, moved by Councillor Vanderstel, second by Councillor Antoski. Um, hmm. Does anybody want anything separate for discussion purposes? No. <laughs> all right. Um, so I'll call the vote then. All those in favor? Opposed, carry. I guess I should confirm, uh, at least you just read the title of the items that we just voted on. There's two of them. Item 4.1, the approval of recommendations forming the 2022 AGM of the Brantford Municipal Nonprofit Housing Corporation, adoption of the 2021 financial statements, appointment of the auditor and appointment of directors for the corporation, and item 5.1.1, the minutes from April 6th. Great. Okay, so there are no resolutions, no notice of motions, and I hereby declare this board of directors meeting.